Death is a powerful part of life. It's also a powerful part of the stories that we tell, and it's certainly an important part of the role-playing games that we play. Role-playing games, though, can vary a lot in how lethal they are for player characters, and maybe even more importantly, they can vary a lot in how permanent death is when it occurs. This can even be true within a single system. In some classic versions of D&D, for example, PCs begin in an ultra-fragile state in which any hit in combat could automatically kill them, and then they'll level up to a point where death is just a, a minor inconvenience, waiting for a raised dead spell. But let's assume that we're playing a game where death really is the final frontier. If your character dies, then they're dead. No takebacks. If you're playing a game like that in a long-term campaign, how can you handle death? One way to duck this question entirely is script immunity. In campaigns with script immunity, PCs simply can't die. This might be a feature of the rules. Uh, for example, in Magical Kitties Save the Day, there are consequences for the kitties suffering owies, but the kitties can't actually die. That's not part of the game. It's even more common, though, for script immunity to be a metagame conceit that's openly or silently respected by the table. In those situations, there are a couple common approaches for making this work. First, you can simply overrule the mechanical outcome of death. The NPC always misses the final lethal blow, or the PC always succeeds on their final death save. Alternatively, you can interpret the mechanical outcome of death to mean something other than death. Uh, for example, the PC is simply knocked unconscious instead. Now, in games that openly acknowledge that the PCs have script immunity, it's also not unusual to have the caveat that a PC can die, but only if their player wants it to happen. Well, okay, but why would a player ever want their character to die? Well, script immunity is often a technique favored by dramatists, and death is dramatically powerful, particularly if you can choose the perfect moment, whether that's the ultimate self-sacrifice or a tragedy that you know will echo across the campaign and never be forgotten. Which is also why I want to focus less on how to avoid PC death and focus more on what comes next. Now, the first option is to actually remove the player from the game. Their PC was their agent in the game world, after all, and now that their agent has been destroyed, they have no ability to participate in the game. Now, in many ways, this is the opposite extreme from script immunity. Where immunity completely removes lethal consequences from the game, the all-or-nothing approach of player elimination makes those consequences about as meaningful as they can be. On the other hand, both script immunity and player elimination recognize how momentous and important death can be to a narrative. They're just choosing to emphasize that importance in radically different ways. With that being said, of course, I've personally never seen player elimination used in a full-length campaign. Whether you're playing at a dedicated table or an open one, it's difficult for me to imagine what it would even look like, except for some sort of, of deliberately experimental game. But it's far from unheard of to see it used in one-shots or convention games, and it can be deliberately built into games like Ten Candles or Dread. The heightened stakes and grim finality can make it a particularly powerful choice for horror games. The far more common choice, of course, is for the player of the dead PC to create a new character so they can continue playing. There are a couple of speed bumps to watch out for when creating replacement characters, though. First, there's the time required to create the new character. This can range from trivial in some systems to complex and time-consuming in others. There can even be some games where it's, it's downright baffling. For example, there are a bunch of RPGs where the PCs are all created together in the first session and interconnected with each other, but some of these games neglect to account for how new PCs could be added to the group later. The second speed bump is how the new PC can be integrated into the existing group. It's not unusual, of course, for a group to lean into the metagame conceit of the replacement. Of course we trust this complete stranger without question. Mark is playing her. But when the group is in the middle of a vast dungeon, or lost in the untracked wastes of an uncharted jungle, there can still be the question of how and when this new character can actually show up and join the group. Now sometimes these two problems nicely cancel each other out. The time it takes to create the new character neatly covers some or all of the time it takes for the rest of the group to reach a point where the new character can be naturally introduced. But more often than not, there'll be some logistical or logical hurdle that you'll have to deal with. 
You can remove some or all of these hurdles by preparing a backup character ahead of time. As the game master, you can unilaterally provide these backup characters by having a, a stack of pre-generated characters ready to go. For something like D&D &D or the Cypher system, you can use a website like FastCharacter.com to almost instantly generate a bunch of bare-bones sheets. Alternatively, you might want to have something a little more substantial in your pocket. Uh, for example, in their Red Star Rising campaign, GooeyQ, the sponsor of today's video, who also have a new campaign called the Tomb of Geisingax coming to Kickstarter later this month, include a couple dozen pre-generated characters, each not only ready to play, but also featuring a beautiful custom illustration and lush, detailed character backgrounds filled with pre-built hooks that will tie the characters directly into the ongoing adventure. A pre-gen character that the GM simply hands to a player, though, isn't the only way to do this. In fact, you'll almost certainly get better results if you have the players prepare their backup characters. Whatever form the backup character takes, it will obviously help us to get over our first speed bump, because the player can instantly pick up their sheet and begin playing their new character without any delay for character creation. But if you also make the effort to give each backup PC a clear connection to the group, you can also smooth out our second speed bump. I've heard my brother was killed. I have come to avenge him. Early versions of D&D even included rules and guidelines for handling PC-to-PC -PC inheritance and probate. Of course, familial connections aren't the only options here. A backup PC could just as easily be an old college roommate, an apprentice, or, or a pen pal. Now that we have a full slate of backup PCs waiting to step in if a current PC should die, and those backup PCs have existing relationships with the current PCs, we have an opportunity. We can incorporate the backup PCs into the game while the current PCs are still alive. Now, now in many ways, this just makes sense. If you've prepped an apprentice who can replace your character Obi-Wan if they die, obviously the apprentice should be part of Obi-Wan's life before Obi-Wan's death. Of course, once a backup character comes on stage like this, it's possible that the evolving narrative will make it more difficult or even impossible for them to become a PC. That's just fine. Uh, for example, Obi-Wan survived long enough that their apprentice really should have become a master. That's when Obi-Wan's relationship with the apprentice got complicated. And then things got really crazy, and Obi-Wan's player decided to just, to just give their apprentice a son. Ah, uh, look, can I just keep the same character sheet but change the name from Anakin to Luke? Yeah, that works. Onstage backup PCs can be played by the GM, but it's often more effective if the player takes on the role uh, prematurely when necessary. To that end, it can be most effective for your backup character to have a connection to a different player's PC. If you're playing your own apprentice, there'll be lots of moments when you'd have to roleplay with yourself, which can easily lead to skipping or abbreviating those scenes. If you're playing Alejandra's apprentice, on the other hand, you'll both be able to frame up interesting scenes and small interactions that will enrich the game. This is similar to the techniques I described in my video on spectacular sidekicks, and I'll include a link to that video in the uh, font of all knowledge down below. Now, along these same lines, you can flip cause and effect here by letting the player of a dead PC take on the role of an established MPC. Even if the MPC wasn't intended to become a PC, the fact they already have an existing relationship with the other PCs makes it easy to, to quickly integrate them into the narrative. Now, another variation of this is to, is to create a common pool of backup characters. Instead of having each player create their own backup character, you just have one or two or, or maybe three backup characters for the whole group. And whichever player's PC dies first simply grabs whatever character they like best from the pool. These backup characters might also just be temporary roles, which can be played until it's convenient to create and bring in a fully-fledged new PC. For example, when I was running a Trail of Cthulhu campaign, we needed to bring in a new PC while the group was in the middle of a, a vast desert. It was likely to be several sessions before the group returned to civilization and the player's new character could join the group. So the player temporarily assumed the role of the expedition's guide and was able to continue playing without missing a beat. Now, the other great thing about having backup characters with existing ties to the PCs is that they can be used to keep a campaign going even in the face of a total party kill, or, or TPK. So-and-so has mysteriously vanished and or been killed, so I'm going to look through their notes, is, after all, a well-established trope in Lovecraftian fiction, and it can be easily transferred to other genres, too. 
laying the groundwork for this kind of insurance policy can be used to frame epistolary play and blue booking, which was the topic of another video I'll include in the uh, font of all knowledge. This, in turn, will encourage the players to keep notes and engage in different forms of role-playing that can greatly augment your campaign. You also, of course, don't have to wait for a PC to die in order to swap to your alternate PC. There might be any number of reasons to do so. Your primary PC might want to retire, uh, be called away on a family emergency, uh, disappear into the fairylands, or go into a witness protection program. Or maybe you just want to switch things up. In fact, you can swap back and forth between your PCs, or across multiple characters. If your group has established a common pool of PC options, you might even find yourself playing the same character that was previously played by a different player. And we've just reinvented troop-style play again. Which is a topic that, once again, we're going to have to tackle in a future video. If you don't want to miss out on that video, make sure to pop down to the uh, font of all knowledge and hit the like, comment, and subscribe buttons. While you're down there, also take a second to click on the link to Gooey Cube's Tomb of Geisingax. Developed in collaboration with Luke Gygax, son of the late Gary Gygax, the Tomb of Geisingax is an enthralling, lampoony, and grimdark mega-adventure and campaign setting that pays tribute and homage to the legendary creators and adventures that forged the legacy of D&D. I'll be talking more about the tomb, the village of Atholm, the village of Bloom, and the Dark Temple in future videos. We're also currently running a community challenge on the Alexandrian Discord to design Easter eggs for the tomb. Join us there to check out entries like the Mask of Zeno, the Curious Nesting Armor, and the Giant's Billiard Table. I'd also love it if you shared one of your own, and Gooey Cube would too. Good gaming. I'm Justin Alexander, and I'll see you at the table.